Hey, hello again, OCC. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Some might say that it would be more grammatically correct for me to say hello to the members and friends of OCC instead of just saying, hey there, OCC. Uh, but I actually think it's great that a lot of the times, not just in my videos, but in Jeff's as well, we're sort of greeting each other by just saying, hello, OCC. It's a good reminder during this stay home period that the church is not the building. When we address OCC, Ozaki Congregational Church, we're not directing our comments to the building. I mean, we have a cute and some might even say lovely sanctuary and we've got a beautiful fellowship hall as well and that's all fine and good but we are the church not the building but us as people and so when i say hey there happy wednesday or happy midweek or just hello to occ i'm talking to people and not to a building it's just a good reminder for us during this uh, quarantine period. So let me ask, how are you? How are we? How are we doing during this period? Who gives a rat's hat? Well, okay. Um, how about this question? When you wake up in the morning and you begin to get your brain oriented out of your dream state and into reality, uh, what do you think when you begin to realize where you are and when you are? The most bellicose barrel full of Bull Durham anybody's ever heard you utter. Well, okay, uh, fair enough. It is a strange period that we're in, isn't it? The days seem to run together, the weeks seem to run together, and now we're even to the point where some of the months are beginning to run together. It's, it's bizarre to think that we're now more than two months into all this, more than eight weeks into all this. Maybe the more significant questions for us are, who are we? As in, what have we learned about ourselves during this safer at home period, during this pandemic crisis? What have we learned about our own personal strength, adaptability, resiliency? What have we learned about the, the assets that we bring to the table? And maybe what have we learned about some of our own personal weaknesses or concerns as well? I've heard it said that this crisis has been like an MRI for society and a lot of you like me have had an MRI it's not a lot of fun they stick you into that tube you're not allowed to move for like half an hour while they do the magnetic imaging of some part of your body in my case it was my neck and shoulders uh, but it's not a great experience but you understand the metaphor when people say that right that this crisis that we're living through has been like an MRI for society. It has shown more clearly and distinctly some of the problems that we have, some of the inequalities, the inequities in society, uh, some of the dysfunctions in our government and in our economy. But it's also shown, I think, quite brightly and clearly some of our great strengths and some of the human compassion that is such a part of our society too. We've seen so many stories on the news and some of us may even see it in our day-to-day -day lives. Examples of people lending a hand and helping out, going out of their way to be helpful to their neighbors in ways that maybe they wouldn't have a couple of months ago before all this started. So an MRI for society. I've also heard it said that the word crisis, if you dig far enough back into its etymology, you'll find that it is sort of like the intersection between danger and opportunity. Crisis being the intersection between danger 
and opportunity. Well, we know the danger. If we're not careful, if we venture out too much, too fast, too carelessly, no hand washing, no sanitizer, no face mask, if we're not careful, any one of us can get sick, or maybe even worse, any one of us could give the illness unwittingly to somebody else, and that person could get sick. And of course, because the virus is potentially life-threatening, this is a, a very grave thing indeed. So we know the danger in this crisis. That's abundantly clear. But do we see some opportunities also as a society to perhaps institute some reforms that might make the new normal post-COVID even better than the old normal pre-COVID? Do we see some of those opportunities? And for us as individuals, have we figured out ways to treat this time, this unusual time when so many of us are still working, but not working in the same methods and modes that we were before, uh, when so many of us still have obligations and, and connections to family and friends, but again, those are not connections that are being experienced in the same ways as before. Are we seeing some opportunities here to take a new and fresh look at some of our ways of living? I've also heard a number of leading psychologists, experts in the field of, you know, the human psyche and human endeavor, give advice to the effect of, well, during this period, we should be focusing on that which we can actually control. And, and in most cases, those experts are giving that advice to us as individuals. So leaving aside for a moment the macro picture of the economy and unemployment, because most of that we can't control. We can't certainly control the virus. The virus is simply a mindless microbe that is going to do whatever it, you know, does. That's just a, a matter of biological science. There's so much that we cannot control. We can't individually exercise much control over what our political leaders do and the decisions that they reach about how to handle this situation economically and, and politically and, yes, in terms of quarantine and safer at home orders and all the rest. There is so much that is outside of our individual control. And that lack of control can lead to a feeling of anxiety and uncertainty and, and, and a different kind of stress than we're accustomed to. So they say, well, not a bad idea to focus on what you can control. And I know, maybe without even realizing it, some of you are adopting that mindset. I've heard people say, well, all I really set out to accomplish this morning was a load of laundry, and I did it, and I feel good about that. Okay, that's, that's totally fine. That's great. Part of our approach to this time is maybe to tweak or adjust our own expectations of ourselves. So uh, setting goals that are perhaps smaller and more achievable makes an awful lot of sense. We've all been cleaning things, so that's something that is within our control. If we set aside time to clean out a junk drawer or a closet or the basement or the attic or the garage, if you've managed to to do that, good for you, that's great. I myself, I've done some of that, certainly, but I've also found myself walking a lot. What in the name of Marco Blessed Polo? And how we treat our bodies, how we exercise, that's at least somewhat within our own control, even during this period. You all know I'm an avid tennis player. I am suffering from a horrible case of tennis withdrawal. It has been since Friday, March 13th, since I've hit a tennis ball. And uh, it really is eating at me. Uh, but 
I just have to take a breath and realize that everyone from the indoor clubs in the area to the United States Tennis Association itself has said that, at least for now, it's probably not safe to play the game of tennis because how do you get around at least touching the same tennis balls as your opponent? Maybe touching the net post or the bench on changeovers, you get it. So my response has been, well, what I can control is to walk. And I'm walking four, five, sometimes six miles a day. Well, zippity doo -dah. And I'm, I'm listening to podcasts and whatnot, and I'm finding it to be uh, some of my favorite time of my day. So that's another element of our lives that we can control. We can eat right. And maybe that's even easier during this time period because we don't have the temptation to go out to restaurants and bars. So we can eat a little more um, healthily, perhaps. That is grade A 100% bull cookies. Uh, we can sleep well and hopefully a lot and give our immune system a little bit of a boost from lots of good eight or nine hour uh, a night sleep. So that's all good. And I've been catching up on television. Oh, pony pucks. Yeah, and I'll throw up here on the screen some of the stuff that I've been into. I mean, uh, over these last few weeks, I have watched the entire first season of Star Trek Picard. You know I'm a big Trekkie. I've watched the entirety of both seasons of Star Trek Discovery. Uh, I have also watched the entire final season of Homeland, which has been one of my longtime favorites. That's been great. I've also, like a lot of you, been reading quite a bit during this period. Uh, and here are some of the things I've just been reading for fun. I, I'll set aside all the theological and devotional stuff uh, that may or may not be of interest of you, to, uh, but... James Patterson, I'm a big fan of the Alex Cross books. I recently read both Target Alex Cross and Criss Cross. Uh, the Tom Clancy, Jack Ryan novels, I'm a big fan of those. I've recently read True Faith and Allegiance, and I'm right now working my way through Oath of Office. And I've been listening to books on Audible, Amazon's Audible service. And uh, during this eight weeks or so of Safer at Home. Uh, during my walks and so forth, I've, I've polished off David Brooks' The Second Mountain. Highly recommended. Great, great book. Whether you read the hard copy or listen to the audio, audio book, highly recommended. Richard Stengel's Information Wars, fascinating if you're into politics and diplomacy and the digital age in which we find ourselves and very inspirational. Kate Bowler's Everything Happens for a Reason. Uh, it is, that audiobook is actually read by the author herself. She is uh, reflecting during this book on her own cancer diagnosis at a young age, you know, in her 20s, uh, as, a, as a young mom, a young wife. Uh, very inspirational stuff. Highly recommend that as well. All right, so during these midweek videos in recent weeks, we have been talking about S words, words that begin with S. And let me remind you of what we've covered so far. We've talked about surprise, stillness, silence, solitude, social and spiritual, those two together as in the difference between social distancing, which we all know about now, but trying to guard against that leading to spiritual distancing, which we don't want, even during this period. And then last week we talked about siege and scarcity. So today we're going to add just one more S word, and that word is steadfast. In this case, we're adding a word that is an adjective rather than a noun, steadfast. So God and God's love is steadfast. 
Now, the word steadfast uh, does not get a ton of everyday usage in, in normal conversation today. But of course, we know that word from various Bible passages, perhaps most famously, Psalm 136. And I'll put up on the screen here just verse 1. And it says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. His steadfast love. Now that psalm, Psalm 136, it's a classic. It has 26 verses, and every verse follows the format of that first verse. So there's a line, and then... The second line is, for every verse, for his steadfast love endures forever. 26 times something is said, and then sort of the refrain is, for his steadfast love endures forever. It's a beautiful, uh, yes, repetitive, yeah, but it's a beautiful message and a beautiful psalm. And it's maybe the most famous Bible passage containing the word steadfast. So what does that word actually mean? In the King James, by the way, that word steadfast, that phrase steadfast love, two-word phrase, is rendered in the King James as simply mercy. God's mercy endures forever. Some other versions of the Bible use the word, and it's, it is one word, loving kindness, spelled the same as the two words, loving and kindness, but just smushed together, loving kindness. God's loving kindness endures forever. The Hebrew word is hesed, and you may see it spelled some places either H-E-S-E-D or C-H-E-S-E-D. Hesed, or if, if you're a Hebrew expert, and I am not, but if you are, you may be able to make that more guttural, you know, sort of chesed kind of thing. Um, so what does that word mean? Well, it means something that is solid, strong, reliable, and flowing from a very deep devotion. It's, it's a type of love that is just so steady, hence the word steadfast. Uh, again, solid, strong, reliable. Day after day, moment after moment, year after year, reliable. Because it flows from a very deep devotion. It flows from the core of who God is. So, it can also be perhaps better understood by what it is not. The kind of steadfast love described by this Hebrew word hesed is definitely not whimsical. It's not based on the, the person doing the loving, in this case God. It's not based on God having a whim one way or the other and just sort of off the cuff deciding to do something or not do something. It's not subject to mood. It's not whether God is having a good day or a bad day, whether God happens to be right now feeling generous or charitable or not. That's not what Hesed is. It's not a love that is situational. It's not based on the particular circumstances of the moment. In other words, it's not variable. It's solid, strong, reliable, flowing from the core of who God is. You might say steadfast love, or the kind of love uh, represented by the Hebrew word hesed, is love that is in God's DNA. It's the kind of love that is just at the core of who God is. It's a part of who God is. Maybe you could argue it's the most important part of who God is. That love that is described in Hebrew as hesed. You know, just a week or so ago, 
I took a, a little five minute video on my on my phone here <clears throat> and I'm not all that great with this stuff. Um, I, you know, I just kind of muddle through and do my best with all of this technology. Um, it's not it's not an easy thing for me uh, at all. But I just kind of whipped out my phone. I was I was out for a walk. I, I saw a nice scene in a park and I took a little five minute video of myself and I texted the link to that video to OCC's college students. And basically it was just a, a video wishing them the best of luck and, and God's blessings as they make their way through exams, final exams, which are right about now. And of course, this is the weirdest exam week in anybody's memory, right? Uh, an exam week that is gonna be entirely online and is not going to involve uh, sitting in a lecture hall writing out answers in blue books or filling in little circles on a Scantron sheet. It's all going to be electronic. And I simply reminded them in that video that God's love is infinite, eternal, and unconditional. Infinite, eternal, and unconditional. God's love is infinite, meaning there is no possible way that God could love us anymore because God loves us infinitely already. God's love is eternal, meaning it spans all the way back to the beginning of time and it will continue on until the end of time. It doesn't come and go. It's not intermittent love. It's eternal love. And God's love is unconditional. And I reminded those college kids in that video, God loves you if you get straight A's or straight D's or anything in between. I could have said straight F's, I guess, but I don't think colleges even give out F's much anymore. Uh, D's is already, you know, you're on probation and you might be kicked out. So that's kind of how I framed it. But you get the idea that in fact, God and God's love are infinite, eternal, and unconditional. Now, the question I think isn't, is God steadfast? Is God's love steadfast? Our answer is of course, yes. The question is, can we be steadfast too? I mean, it's not a slam dunk to aspire to the same quality as God. I mean, that is, that's a tall order. That's a high bar. And clearly, it's one that we can't fully achieve because God is God and we are not. But the word steadfast, the Hebrew word hesed specifically, does come up in the Old Testament in reference to us. And it's a very famous little verse I'll put up on the screen here for you from Micah chapter six, the prophet Micah, one of the, the 12 so-called minor prophets of the Old Testament. By the way, only referred to as minor because the book bearing his name is shorter than the books of the major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, which are incredibly long. Uh, the minor prophets are shorter books, but it doesn't mean of minor importance. It just means shorter writing. So that famous verse in Micah chapter 6, verse 8 says, He, and that's God, He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Can we do that? that? That phrase, to love kindness, that's hesed. That the Hebrew word hesed occurs in that, in that verse. That's the idea. Can we also exercise unconditional love? Can we show that unconditional love to our family, to our friends, to other people, and yes, to God. 
can our love be less up and down and variable and whimsical and subject to our moods and situationally defined? Can we get away from that? And can we get more like God's love, just unconditional, steady, reliable, flowing from the core of who we are? Can we do justice and love kindness, unconditional love, and walk humbly with our God? I'd like to show you now uh, something that is here in my apartment that actually a wonderful couple at OCC gave to me, gosh, uh, more than a decade ago now, uh, around the time that I joined the staff at OCC full-time and was ordained. Let me show you. Here's what I'm talking about. Now take a look at this wonderful little wooden plaque and think about it in terms of Hesed, steadfast love, steadfast love, love that is not situational, but love that is steady and consistent regardless of the circumstances. Look at the advice. Happy moments, praise God, but difficult moments perhaps like what we're going through right now. Seek God. Quiet moments, worship God. Painful moments, trust God. Every moment, thank God. What a great, simple, for sure, but what a great sort of encapsulation of good advice that our connection, our love of God, our love for God, our connection to God should not be defined by circumstances. It shouldn't sort of wax and wane depending on whether we feel good physically, whether people are treating us nicely today, whether the weather is pleasant outside or not, whether we're stressed or relaxed, no, what, what we're called to do with steadfast love is be more consistent, be steady, be focused on God's love for us, steadfast love, and then how can we share that steadfast love with other people, those who are important in our lives, but even with neighbors and strangers on the street. So those are some thoughts for today about our S word, steadfast. We add that to the list, of course. And before we sign off, uh, a few little reminders. First of all, some of you may have missed, because it was sort of embedded or slipped into the May 3rd Sunday email with the links to the videos, slipped in there was a, a quick mention of the OCC Home Devotional. You may recall from pre-COVID days that uh, I used to, about once a month, write a bulletin insert that was a devotional piece designed for you to take home and read on your own time. Um, well, I did one uh, for May 3rd, even though we're in a safer at home period, and so obviously there are no paper bulletins. So I, I did something that I've never done before, and that is I, I produced this little devotional two different ways. First, there is a PDF that you can print. And then secondly, I also recorded it with my voice as an MP3 audio file. You could almost use that the same as a podcast. You could just download the file to your phone or your iPad or your laptop or whatever you use and you could listen to it. It's only about eight minutes long, not, not a very big file at all. How do you find that, though? If you don't any longer have the video or the uh, email that Jeff sent out on May 3rd, don't sweat it. You can go to occhurch.org, that's our website, slash sermons, 
And then you'll need to scroll down a little bit past some of Jeff's videos, and you'll come to a section of the screen that looks like this. And right there, you can see that there is not only that black box or black bar that has the audio file, you can play it right there, or you can save it and download it to your device. Or below it, you can click the blue uh, writing, and you can download the, the PDF uh, printable document of that devotional or any of the last year or so's devotionals. They're all up there. So I wanted you to be aware of that. Here's another little did you know for you. Uh, Bob Smith, who is one of our, of course, choir members and longtime OCC faithful and a midweek Bible study regular in our Tuesday night group. Well, Bob has a podcast that is really terrific, and it's called The Off-Ramp. Here's the the graphic that goes with that podcast, sort of the title slide, if you will. Um, and it's great stuff. And lately, during the Safer at Home period, he has been joined uh, on the air or basically in the uh, sound booth. He has been joined by his wife, Marsha, another OCC member, of course. And Bob and Marsha have been doing all kinds of jokes and trivia and little uh, nuggets and snippets of things. Lately, they've been calling it stir crazy trivia or lockdown trivia, things like that. I listen to, I subscribe to the podcast. I listen to every episode. Uh, before COVID 19, they were uh, more, uh, you could say, intellectually meaty in the sense that they're, they dealt with historic subjects, um, episodes, issues. Uh, current situations in society, biographical material. Uh, there was all of that. But during the pandemic crisis, it's mostly been this lighthearted banter between Bob and Marsha, and it's it's been such good fun. Hot mustard! Uh, and also, you know, the trivia has been intellectually stimulating too. So I encourage you, if you are a podcast person at all, whether you get them on, you know, iTunes or Google or Spotify or however you get your podcasts, I encourage you to look for the off ramp with Bob Smith and click subscribe and, and take a listen to that. You also may have heard that we are tentatively targeting Sunday, May 31st, which is only two and a half weeks away for a potential, mm, I, I'm, I'm nervous about this, but you know, that word gets kicked around, reopening of OCC, meaning in-person worship in the sanctuary, and also, by the way, the annual meeting, which is going to be about a month overdue at that point. Now, personally, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of reading the tea leaves of what the CDC is saying, what the White House is saying, and what Governor Evers and the Wisconsin Department of Health are saying. Personally, I think May 31st is pretty, I would consider it iffy if I were you, at least with regard to in-person worship. But it may very well be that we somehow try to have the OCC annual meeting at least, and that may be via Zoom uh, in order to pull that off. There are just a, two or three or four uh, agenda items on, on the docket for that day, for that meeting. Uh, I don't think any of them are particularly controversial. I think the votes, if, if they're not unanimous, I think they're likely to be overwhelming. Um, at least that's kind of my sense of things. And so we're, I think, going to try to figure out a way to do this on May 31st. I say that all to you to encourage you to stay tuned. Be watching your email. Be watching any messaging from OCC, from Jeff, or from any member of the church council, 
or from me if I'm told exactly what's up, I'll let you know too. Um, but be, have in your mind, May 31st may be an important morning for OCC. If not, if it just turns out to be not doable medically or technologically or otherwise, well, we'll make other arrangements sometime in June or whenever it does become a little more safe and feasible. So those are things to keep in mind. Now I mentioned quite a bit earlier that uh, a lot of expert psychologists and social workers and so forth are encouraging us to focus on that which we can control. And with that sort of idea or theme in my mind, I could think of no better prayer to close us out today than the serenity prayer. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with some version of that. There are multiple versions of this prayer. You may or may not know that it was written by Reinhold Niebuhr, a clergy person, theologian, professor in, in seminaries, uh, was a professor and mentor of OCC's founding minister, Dick Bookman. And by the way, Reinhold Niebuhr was also the author of a number of books. This is a fairly famous one right here, Moral Man and Immoral Society. I've got that on my shelf from my seminary days. He had a pretty noteworthy brother also, H. Richard Niebuhr, who wrote famously Christ and Culture, among other books. So this is a, a pretty famous guy, Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, and he wrote this prayer, and it's, it's thought that he wrote the first version of it way back in the early 1930s during the depths of the Great Depression. And maybe that knowledge makes this prayer resonate all the more with us today as we face such a crisis, both medically as well as economically. The, the prayer fits on two screens, and I'll put it up here and feel free to pray it with me or just listen to my voice as, as we pray. God, give me the grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change the things which should be changed and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. So until next time, folks, keep yourself safe and healthy and well, and by all means, keep the faith. We'll talk to you again soon.